Today we are going to learn the anatomy of the parotid gland, which is one of the major salivary glands. So let's get started. There are three major salivary glands, and these are paired, meaning there is one on each side. The three major salivary glands are parotid, submandibular, and sublingual gland. Along with the minor salivary glands, they secrete approximately 500 milliliters of saliva per day. This is the parotid salivary gland. Remember that this is the largest of the salivary glands, with the average weight of 25 grams. The salivary secretion of this gland is completely serous. Serous means thin watery secretion that contains a lot of proteins. It makes up for about 20 to 25% of the saliva formed by salivary glands. So first, look at the shape of the gland. This is described as having inverted triangular or pyramidal shape as you can see that it tapers inferiorly to a blunt apex. This gland has two lobes superficial and deep and it is yellowish in color. Now let's look at the surfaces of this gland. It has a superior surface, superficial surface, anteromedial surface, and posteromedial surface. The superior surface is concave as you can see here. This surface is related to the external acoustic meatus and the posterior aspect of the temporomandibular joint. Can you see the auriculotemporal nerve here? This is embedded in the capsule of the gland. The apex of the gland overlaps the posterior belly of digastric as you can see. The capsule of this gland comes from the deep cervical fascia and it is extremely tough in nature which is why when there is inflammation and swelling of the gland, it's a very painful condition. An example of such condition is mumps, which is a type of parotitis. The superficial surface of the gland is covered by skin and superficial fascia. The anteromedial surface is grooved by the posterior border of mandibular ramus. This muscle here is the masseter muscle, and you can see how the anteromedial surface of the parotid gland is covering the posterior part of this muscle. Approximately 75 to 80% of the gland covers the masseter muscles. This surface also covers the lateral aspect of the TMJ and the mandibular ramus. Now you know that the anteromedial surface is grooved by the posterior border of the mandibular ramus. So let's see this in the cross section of the gland here. You can see that the anteromedial surface passes forwards medial to the ramus to reach the medial pterygoid muscle. In this way, it is divided into the superficial lobe and the deep lobe. The area where these two join is called a isthmus, and as you can see, the branches of the facial nerve emerge on the face from the anterior margin of this anteromedial surface. Now this is the mastoid process. Here, the posteromedial surface is grooved by the mastoid process, sternocleidomastoid muscle, posterior belly of digastric and styloid process, which is not seen here. So, let's have a look at this in the 3D model. We will remove the parotid gland to see the structure underneath the posteromedial surface. You can now see the posterior belly of digastric muscle, sternocleidomastoid muscle, and mastoid process. So these are the relations of the posteromedial surface. The posterior belly of digastric muscle, sternocleidomastoid muscle, and the mastoid process. The anteromedial and posteromedial surfaces meet at a medial margin, which is projecting so deeply that it contacts the lateral wall of the pharynx. So, when a parotid tumor develops in the deep lobe of the gland, it presents as a swelling in the lateral wall of the pharynx, and not as a facial swelling. Now let's understand the structures that are passing through this gland. The facial nerve is intimately associated with the gland, and understanding its anatomy is important. The facial nerves exits the skull through the stylomastoid foramen. Try this. Place your finger in front of the mastoid and try to feel the cleft between the mastoid and the cartilaginous part of the external auditory meatus. Deep within this gap, the facial nerve exists and here it can be exposed surgically. After coming out from the skull from the stylomastoid foramen, it enters the parotid gland. From the anterior border of the gland, the five terminal branches of the facial nerve pass forwards into the face. You can see these branches here, 
temporal, zygomatic, buccal, mandibular, and cervical. The external carotid artery travels through the parotid gland and gives off branches within this gland. These branches are posterior auricular artery, maxillary artery, and superficial temporal artery. Superficial temporal artery gives off another branch which is called as transverse facial artery which you can see here. Superficial to the external carotid artery, the retromandibular vein passes through the parotid gland. This vein is formed by the union of superficial temporal vein and maxillary vein. Typically, the retromandibular vein exits the inferior portion of the parotid gland and divides into an anterior division, which joins the facial vein to form the common facial vein and a posterior division which joins the posterior auricular vein to form the external jugular vein. Another structure coming from the parotid gland is the parotid duct, also known as Stenson's duct, named after Niels Stenson, who was an eminent Danish anatomist. The Stenson's duct is 5 cm long and 3 mm wide, but the width is less at the opening of the duct in the mouth. You can see how the duct appears at the anterior border of the upper part of the gland and passes horizontally across the masseter muscle parallel to the zygomatic arch. It crosses masseter and then turns medially at the anterior border of masseter at almost right angles and passes through the buccal fat pad and buccinator and opens on a small papilla opposite maxillary second molar. Separated from the main parotid gland, do you see the glandular tissue here over the parotid duct? That's the accessory parotid gland. This is not seen in every individual. It's an anatomic variation. A lot of studies have been done to notice the incidence of this variation, and the overall result of those studies was that the accessory parotid is seen in around 30% of the population. The prevalence was more in studies done on cadvars. It was 35.8% and in 77.8% of cases, it was present only on one side. These accessory parotid glands have their own blood supply from the transverse facial artery and have secondary duct emptying into the Stenson's duct. Why are we talking about this structure? Because it has a clinical significance. The accessory parotid gland is more prone to parotid tumors than the main parotid gland and when it is present, it can complicate the parotidectomies, meaning parotid removal surgeries. So it's mandatory to identify it and remove it during parotidectomy so that recurrence does not occur. Coming to arterial supply of the gland, the parotid gland receives its arterial supply from the external carotid artery and its branches within and near the gland. We just learned these branches posterior auricular, maxillary, superficial temporal, and its branch, transverse facial artery. The venous drainage of the gland is to the external jugular vein. There are usually around 10 lymph nodes present in the gland. The majority of them lie in the superficial part of the gland. Lymph from the parotid gland drains to the upper deep cervical lymph nodes. So that's all about the parotid gland. In the next video, we will understand the anatomy of the submandibular and sublingual glands.